you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me this morning to Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8, and we will be looking at verses 30 through 35. Joshua chapter 8, beginning with verse 30. So, Christians, especially today, um, have an interesting idea, if you will, uh, specifically here in America, as to exactly how Christianity works. Um, I believe it was George Jones a number of years ago. You all know I like picking on country music, right? That's not obvious by now, then y'all have not been paying attention. But George Jones wrote a song a while back uh, called Me and Jesus, and uh, it, it basically goes, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Me and Jesus, we've got our own little thing going over here. And, and so Christians so much of the times kind of have this idea uh, of what is Christianity. Uh, Christianity is uh, me and Jesus doing our own little thing. And although that is true, a personal relationship with Christ is uh, the gospel itself. That is Christianity in its essence, is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior. But so much of the time, we, we get this idea of it's just us and Jesus, that we forget that part of Christianity is loving Jesus together. Loving Jesus together, but particularly under the guidelines that God has given us in his word. Our message today that we see here in the book of Joshua chapter 30 is that believers must obey the word together. Believers must obey the word together. And you'll see what I mean by that uh, as we go through and work through this text verse by verse. We are about to take up and read, but before we do, let us ask for the Lord's help in prayer. Oh, great God and heavenly Father, Lord, you um, are amazing and wonderful. Um, we thank you, Lord, dearly for this time that we get to spend together each week, O oh God. Let us cherish this time, O oh Lord, where we together as believers can spend time specifically to worship you. Lord, help us to consecrate this time, to sanctify this time by casting away the idolatry of our fears and our worries for the things that go on in life, O oh God, but that this time here now would be time marked by the right worship of you through the preached word, O oh God, that we might hear your words. Help the people here today, Lord, not see me up here trying to say what it is that I believe that you're saying, O oh God, but that they might see that your words are true, O oh God. Help us together, O oh Lord, corporately unify that we might grow closer together, O oh Lord, as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with our minds now, O oh Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from Joshua chapter 8, beginning with verse 30. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel... He wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native-born, with their elders and officers and their judges, 
stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gizarim, and half of them in front of Mount Evil, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. And the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. That is the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God. May he add his blessing to it. So what I want us to see today, specifically from this text, are, are three ways in which Christians worship God corporately. Three ways in which Christians worship God corporately. And so what I really want us to see here in particularly is the way that Joshua is constantly pointing to all of the people here, all of the, the Israelites together corporately are submitting themselves to the word of God, submitting themselves to the word of God corporately. So point one, I want us to look at this in verse uh, 30 and 31, obeying God's word corporately, obeying God's word corporately. So up until this point, we've come through quite a journey in, in the book of Joshua. Uh, uh, we've come a long way, so um, starting off the book, we, we spend, it seems like, forever uh, just hearing the constant refrain, and you, when you pass over, and when you pass over the Jordan, and you go through so many chapters of, and when you pass over the Jordan, and they finally pass over the Jordan, you're like, oh, fi finally, I, I was getting in the back seat of the van, I was getting worried, and I was, I was feeling that inner five-year-old come out of me and saying, how much longer? How much longer? Soon, soon, it's going to happen. And so finally they cross over the Jordan. They go into Jericho. God utterly delivers Jericho into the hands of the Israelites. And we find out that during this time, God had specifically told them, listen, of all the things there, it's all to be devoted to me. Anything that can be devoted to me is to be devoted to the Lord your God. Everything else is to be burned. Leave it all. And our friend uh, Achan takes some stuff and keeps for himself. And this brings on some, some uh, bad news bears for the Israelites. And so uh, they, they go to fight Ai, and they are defeated, and they come back. And uh, Joshua prays to the Lord, what's going on? Uh, we've come this far, and we finally crossed over it. We thought it was going to be forever, and we're here now, and we lose to Ai. What? What's going on? Okay, go into the tribes, find who has broken the law and taken from uh, that which is to be devoted to the Lord and, and do that. So they find Achan uh, and he and his family are stoned. Then they come back and they fight Ai again where we were last week. And the Lord delivers them uh, into the hands of the Israelites. The, the Israelites have a sweeping victory against those in Ai. And as soon as that's done, it's a, a quick and abrupt transition, right? You've gone from fighting battles, fighting battles. They've just won. It's been a long discourse in chapter 8 about winning this battle in Ai. And then all of a sudden, you, you appear and, and they're building an altar on Mount Evil. Now, uh, if we had some nice maps back here, we would see that they've jumped from Ai north about 20 miles to Shechem uh, and Mount Ebal. And so they're there now building this altar. And so what um, is happening here is actually a prophecy being fulfilled from Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 27. In Deuteronomy 11, uh, Moses tells the people, listen, when you do make it into the land, what you're going to do, you're going to go to Shechem, there to Mount Ebal, and you're going to build you an altar it's not been cut with stone. It's got to be this whole um, perfect, pure rock that's not been chopped away. Um, and what it's trying to convey, it's where we kind of get the, the word shalom from. You, you've heard that term used here before. It's this whole, pure, right, untouched rock that's to be specifically for the right worship 
of God. And so they build this altar there. And then in Deuteronomy 7, uh, in, in 27 and 28, um, Joshua is to repeat the covenant blessings and the covenant cursings that Moses gave there. And so these cor- uh, blessings and curses are um, obey the law of the Lord and you will do well. And if you don't, it won't go all that great. And we see that in the first half of Joshua. If you want a good example, just go back and reread again. When they're obeying the Lord, uh, Jericho's delivered in their hands. And when they're not, uh, the consequences are AI, where uh, everyone in his family and all of his doggies and his kitties are stoned. And it's not a good thing. So obey the word of the Lord. Now then, uh, they, they come here and, and they see this. And so what the author here is really trying to do is to show us this right worship of God. What are they doing here differently than they were before? They had just lost to AI previously. They weren't obeying God. They they didn't follow the law of the Lord. But here they are. Then... Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the Israelites, as all that is written in the law. They built this altar of stones that had not been touched by iron, and they offered up whole burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. They're doing exactly what the Lord has done. They're letting the word of God regulate or show them how they are to rightly worship God. Do you understand? In, in the past, we've, if you'll read through history, you'll, you'll read of certain monarchs, certain kings uh, who were uh, particularly ruthless. But then you, you read of kings who were typically described as being nice kings, respectful kings. And even then, there were certain rituals throughout uh, history on which normal people, common people, were to go before the king uh, and petition the king in certain ways, right? You, you couldn't walk up to him in, in a, with a certain posture. In some cultures, you can't actually look eye to eye with the king because that's a form of disrespect. And yet we see in certain cultures where people break these understandings and, and they're killed because of it or severely punished. Why is that? Well, they didn't follow the rules. They, they disrespected the king in a certain way. They, they know the rules, or they should know the rules, and they say, you know what, I'm going to make my own rules. I know I'm not supposed to walk up here and shake the king with my left hand, but you know what, I don't care. I make the rules. And they usually get uh, killed because of it. Why is it that so often we never really think about worshiping God rightly, do we? We, we think, ah, oh, he's just, again, I like the, this analogy, he's just like sweet Santa Claus in the sky, jolly grandpa who calls it Christmas. But that's not the God of the universe. Not worshiping God rightly together is disrespectful, but ultimately it shows our idolatry. When we come to the Lord and, and we worship him uh, in whatever way we please, we, we sing uh, just whatever and, and say certain things about God, or we pray to God in uh, wrongful ways, in disrespectful ways, what we're saying is, Lord, I don't care that you're God. I don't recognize the fact that you are the sovereign and holy God of the universe. Isn't it a fearful thing to pray to a holy God? Don't you remember in Sinai that the Israelites are there at the base of the mountain And the Lord just speaks. He just speaks. And the Israelites are so terrified, they beg Moses to go and ask him to stop. If he keeps talking, we're all going to die. 
And yet we come to the Lord sometimes in prayer and say, give me this, give me this, give me this. Hey, give me this. I guess you can do this over here. When was the last time you prayed to God and said, God, you're amazing? You just took a minute to think about how big and how marvelous and how holy your God actually is. Some biblical examples, if you will, of of people who worshipped God not according to God's word. We have uh, the famous story of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. So Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's sons. They were uh, the next in line for the priests, and so they, they worked in the temple with their dad. And one day in Leviticus chapter 10, they offer up to to the Lord what is known as strange fire. That's all the text really says. Uh, And in censers that weren't consecrated to the Lord. And because they did not follow the rules, they were consumed with fire. They were killed because they offered up to the Lord strange fire. Is God wrong in doing that? God is not wrong in doing that. And if we think he is, we don't know how holy he is. Our friend Achan, just back in chapter 7, the things that he took were to be devoted to the Lord. It was a form of worship. The, these things are to be God's, the, your, your worship in giving, if you will. And yet, what does Achan do? He says, I don't care about the law. I don't care about what you said. You say these are yours, but I say they're mine, God. Uzzah, 2 Samuel chapter Six, they're going along. David is having uh, the Ark of the Covenant moved, and it starts to teeter off the, the cart that it's on, and Uzzah puts up his hand to stop it from falling, and he's struck dead because he didn't follow the rules. He didn't take into consideration that God and the worship of God is a serious serious thing. Of course, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, what, what do they do? They sell a plot of land. They look at the sum that they gather from selling the land, and we say, uh, we're going to give to them this amount, but we're going to keep back this for ourselves. And so they take it in uh, to, to the apostles and the disciples, and they give it to them and say, here you go. And they say, is this all that you got for that land? And they're Yes, mm-hmm, it is. It's all, this is all we made. And they both fall dead. And we, sometimes we come to that passage, and if we're really thinking about it, we're, I mean, they gave, they gave, you know, they gave to the Lord. It was probably more than 10%, I would imagine. And, and yet they, they fall over dead. Their worship in their giving, they were supposed to give all. They committed to give all. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. And they said, we make our own rules. And they fell dead. Even the biblical words for worshiping uh, have built within them this sense of utter reverence for God. The Hebrew word uh, for for worship is, is, uh, it actually has its own special stem uh, to to give it this connotation, to set it apart. It's its very own action to describe its very own action, and it means literally to bend over at the waist, to bow down before God Almighty. The a uh, Greek word is proskuneo. That's where we get uh, the term prostrate, but just out on the floor, worshiping God face down because we're unworthy to worship him otherwise. Worshiping God is a serious business, and it should always be marked by reverence. So then how... How does the Bible tell us to worship God? What are we to do to worship 
God rightly. We realize that worshiping God is not something we can do in, in a flippant and, and half-hearted sort of manner. We don't make the rules worshiping God. Does that make sense? Jesus, in John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, He's uh, speaking there to the Samaritan woman, and uh, he tells us how he's supposed to to worship. Uh, The woman says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that uh, we're only supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Believe me, the hour has come where where worshipping in in Jerusalem, that's going on, but... But a time is coming, and listen to this, is now here. A time is coming and is now here when the Lord will seek for himself true worshipers. How are they to worship God? In verse 23, in spirit and in truth. A couple things to look at here. First, worshiping God in spirit. If we don't worship God in the spirit, we don't worship God at all. If you don't worship God in spirit, you don't worship God at all. If you come to church on Sunday and say, I'm ready to worship, and by that, I'm ready to roll through the motions. I'm ready to sit in the pew and take on the show that's been prepared for me. I'm fully ready for the entertainment. You know, sometimes it almost is uh, a shame that our worship leader is so talented because sometimes you almost have that thing, I just kind of want to listen to him sing. But we worship in spirit. Worshiping in spirit means that we lift our hearts heavenward. We don't just sing the words up on the screen, but we we revel in them. We take them to heart and we give them to God. We take a minute, just a small hour, a fraction of our time once a week to gather here today to tell God how great he is. And this is something that we can't do without the Holy Spirit. You'll always roll through the motions in worship without the Holy Spirit. So we worship in spirit, but we also worship in truth. We also worship in truth. If we don't worship in truth, we don't worship the living God. If we don't worship in truth, we don't worship the living God. Not all things that are said of God are true. How do we know what is true of God? How do we know what is right to to lift up in song to God? From his word. We have to submit ourselves corporately to the word of God. Worship should be marked by our obedience to the scriptures. If we do not worship in truth, we don't worship the living God. And in fact, we worship the idols of our own minds. We worship Maybe the idea of God. We worship the tradition that we have. We worship our preferences. But if we don't worship in truth, we don't worship the living God. And then finally, what I want us to see uh, here as Jesus is telling us, this is what right worship of God looks like. The time is coming and is now here where you will worship in spirit and in truth. But look at what it says. He's looking for these. The Father is looking for those who will worship in spirit and in truth. And he's seeking worshipers. The people here described as those worshiping in spirit and in truth in this section are always described in the plural. You're not meant to worship by yourself. Christians rightly worship in spirit and in truth, but in spirit and in truth together. Right worship 
is worshiping God in spirit and in truth together. And the only way we do that is under the submission of God's inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God. Obey God in corporate worship. Secondly, obeying God's word in corporate union. Obeying God's word in corporate union. Look at me uh, with me at verses 32 through 33. 32 through 33. And it was written there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which was written before the children of Israel. And all the Israelites, sojourner, that is foreigner, the ones who were not native-born of the Israelites, as well as the native-born, and the elders, and the officers, and the judges, were standing, half of them on one side of the altar, half of them on the other side, half of them uh, on uh, Mount Evil, and half on the other side, on Mount Gizarim. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded them, First, he, he commanded them previously, uh, might be a better translation there, to bless the children of Israel or the people of Israel. So what they're doing here is all the Israelites have gathered together and are corporately unified through uh, obedience to the word of God and in corporate worship. So, so what is Joshua doing? He's taking... He, he's building an altar there uh, at Shechem, right there in the middle. Uh, the city of Shechem, which is 20 miles just north of Ai. On one side, you have Mount Gizarim, and on the other side, you have Mount Evil. And there's this big uh, big plain here in the middle. And so he's, he's right here. Half of them are on one side on Mount Gaz- Gizarim, and half are on the other side on Mount Evil. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is right here in the middle. And Joshua is before all of them building an altar to consecrate the thing, the victory that they've had. And coming into the, the uh, Canaanite region, they're sending out enemies and they're offering up sacrifices to the Lord. But not only that, he's also making a new uh, uh, tablet or a new uh, written law. The word of God at this time. All, all they have at this is, is the book of Moses, right? Or, or the first five books there. The, the law that Moses has given previously. And so he, he's writing out all the law. And what this is, is they're saying, first we worship God and we worship him according to his word. But we also read God's word together. And notice how here Joshua wants you to see that everybody's there. He, he goes to great lengths throughout this passage to say all of the Israelites. He could just say the Israelites are there. But he goes above and beyond, does he not? All of uh, the children of Israel, uh, the sojourner or the foreigner, the native born, the elders, the officers, the judges, they're all standing here. And they're seeing everything. The priests are there who take up the, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And notice where they're standing or how they're structured. What is directly in the middle? It's none other than the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, i.e. the presence of God. We see this time and time again. The Ark, it means the presence of God. He's there. Also, it's fairly significant that all of Israel is unified. Okay? So if you have ever read cover to cover of the whole Bible, you come to the Old Testament, one thing you might note, there are very few times where all of the people of Israel are completely and totally unified. It's very rare. It's almost a breath of fresh air. You, you, it, it, you, you watch certain uh, reality TV shows and everybody's always at each other's throat. Imagine if you watched an episode where they're all gathered together and you're like, you know what? We just love everybody. We're all getting together and things are going great. There's no drama here whatsoever. People probably wouldn't watch it. 
But you have uh, three quarters of the whole Bible here, thousands and thousands of pages devoted, and you have very few times where all of the Israelites are completely united. Remember back in Sinai, in the wilderness, they get hungry, and they get tired, and they get fussy, like a bunch of toddlers in Walmart. They stomp their little feet, and they cry, and they whine until they get their way, but they don't get their way, right? Then we fast forward to the next book of the Bible, after Joshua comes Judges. Well, they're never unified here. Uh, they're all over the place, and uh, the, the constant refrain throughout the book of Judges is everyone did right in their own eyes, and there was no king in the land during this time. You fast forward to the book of Samuel, and what are they doing? They're griping and complaining and asking for a king, so he raises up Saul. Well, that doesn't pan out, so he raises up David. Well, some people like David, but Saul doesn't like David. And then finally, uh, Saul dies, and David is consecrated as king. He takes his seat on the throne, and all of a sudden, now he has his son after him. Well, this is awful. Oh, it just never ends. Then finally, you come to the, the book of Kings, and they just decide, you know what? We're splitting up, gang. The family, it, uh, the, the children of Israel family band is, is breaking up, guys. We're going one way, y'all are going another. We'll see how this works. And they never really rejoin throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And yet here, in these six verses, we see that the covenant people of God are unified. They're together. Why are they unified? What's different here? Well, for one, they have a righteous leader in submission to the word of God. Joshua, as soon as he gets to Shechem, divides the people up. Half of y'all go to Gizarim, half of y'all go to Evil. We're going to do what Moses told us to do in Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 27. We're going to build an altar to the Lord of uncut stone. We're going to offer up whole burnt offerings and peace offerings, and we're going to write out the word of God so I can read it to you, I can teach it to you, and you all can know it. We're submitting to this wholeheartedly no matter what. Next, they're submissive to their leader. They follow their leader. They've seen the, the results of disobeying the word of God and disobeying God's ordained leader who's in submission to the word of God. So they're submitting to him. They follow his instructions. They're in obedience to the commands as seen in Deuteronomy 11. They go to where they're supposed to go, and they wait. But most importantly, they have God in their midst. At the very center of this gathering, this brief moment in Israel's history, they're worshiping God rightly with God, the Ark of the Covenant, a symbol of God's presence, there in their midst. If you talk to soldiers, it's, it's pretty interesting. You'll, you'll see people in the military from very different backgrounds, from, from uh, different walks of life even, but isn't it interesting how a unified submission to the commander for a unified cause leads to a unified army and ultimately to brotherly love? Now, uh, I don't know if mom has uh, mentioned to y'all, um, but her favorite show and all of our favorite shows, she's the marketeer, as, as it were. They should commission her for uh, the uh, series Poldark. Do we have any fans? No? Yeah! It's so good. Oh, I love Poldark, and I don't like TV, but I love Poldark. So in one episode, there, there's this uh, really awesome young doctor who's this, um, you know, and, uh, uh, he, he, he's this real charitable guy. He, he could make a fortune as a great doctor, but he, he goes and he takes care of the poor. Well, eventually he goes and he joins the Navy to, to get more uh, experience. So it's during this time in his, na uh, in his naval career 
And during the, the time in which the, the setting of the, the series is going on, England is at France with war, and his ship is uh, sunk, and he's taken captive, and he and a bunch of the other British troops are, are kept uh, as prisoners of war. And it's atrocious. It's, it, it's uh, uh, this dismal scene throughout. And the whole time he's there being the, the great guy that he is taking care of, of all of uh, the, the different uh, injured soldiers. But it's a, it's a detrimental um, part in this series. And, and so uh, Ross Poldark, the main character, goes in and uh, as the, the, the great hero of, of the show, he goes in and he takes his friend Dr. Ennis and they fly and they get back, hop on the ship and, and make it back to, to England. And once uh, uh, Dr. Ennis gets back to England, he goes and he joins his, his recently wed bride together and she's just expecting everything to be back to normal and yet he's been terribly scarred by his time as a prisoner of war. He has severe uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and he just can't cope. And his wife is trying to console him and comfort him and she just doesn't understand. The only thing that can comfort and console Dr. Ennis is another friend that went through it with him. They were unified because they had a unified cause, as a unified army. They were unified by their circumstance. They were unified by their commission. And even in his darkest hours, it was the person who he had worked with, he had fought with, he had suffered with, that was even closer and more comforting than his own wife. What about Christians? Sometimes we're not exactly the most unified group that the world has ever seen, are we? People don't exactly look at the church today and say, wow, what a unified group of believers. Wow, look at how they love one another. Wow, look at how they do life together. It's almost supernatural. It's almost like there's a Holy Spirit or something involved uniting them together. But doesn't Jesus tell us in John 13, 35, the world will know you by your love for one another. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, he says, Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Why are the people in 1 Peter chapter 1 unified? They have purified themselves and they are unified in their obedience to the word of God. Why do they love one another? Because they're in obedience to the word of God. You have shown yourself, Peter says, you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. That is the word of God. So that, with the result that, you have a sincere love for one another. Therefore, what are you to do? Love one another deeply from the heart. How are you to do that? Through the living the enduring word of God. Do you want corporate unity, church? The way you get corporate unity is through obedience to the word of God. That's what Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 35 are talking about. A unified group of believers, unified by their obedience to the Lord God through his word. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He opens it up and says, I appeal to you, brothers. I, I have heard these things. I plead with you that you will agree with one another in what you say, and there will be no division among you, but that you will be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and telling them, 
I've gotten reports that y'all just don't get it. Some of y'all are like, I follow Apollo. Some of y'all are like, I, I'm all about that team Peter. Some of y'all are all about team Paul. Some of y'all say, well, I just like Jesus. And then he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of y'all because then you would be even more crazy. You would say, well, Paul baptized me. I'm better than all y'all. Christians <laughs> have picked really petty things to divide over even from the beginning. I guess that shouldn't be too comforting, but for some reason it kind of is. But then he, he says later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just as one body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized, listen to this, by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Christians, be unified. So how does this apply to us? We should be unified. We see here in verses uh, 32 and 33, why are they unified? They're working together to accomplish God's commission to them. God has commissioned the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. They have a core mission, and they're going to go do it. What else? They have God at their very center. Verse 33, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was there in the middle. Each of them are on each side. They are fully submitted to their leader, Joshua. Church, are we striving after God's commission to us to make disciples of all the nations? Do we have our hearts and our minds, the very centerpiece of our being, to glorify and honor God? Are we in full submission to the true and better Joshua, King Jesus. That is how we should be. And that is what we strive for. Then finally, point three, obey God's word in corporate study. Obey God's word in corporate study. Verses 34 through 35 say, And after this, uh, Joshua called all the words uh, of the law, all the blessings and the cursings, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will, as it was written in the book of the law. And there was not a single word which uh, Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read or call out or speak in order that all the congregation or all the assembly of the Israelites, the women, the little ones, the children, and the sojourners, any of them, which dwell in their midst. What is it trying to say here? It's pretty clear. Joshua read all the words. He didn't leave any of them out. He didn't get to numbers and decide, well, they don't want to hear this. This isn't that important. We'll just skip to the good stuff in Deuteronomy. No. He read all of the words, the, the, the blessings and the cursings. Of course, these blessings and the cursings uh, we find are in Deuteronomy 27 and, and 28, as we spoke before. Uh, the summation of them is, uh, obey the Lord your God and all that he has commanded you previously. If you don't uh, and you transgress the law, you don't follow the way that God has commanded you to live, you will be cursed. And if you do follow them, you will be blessed. Uh, the rains will be plentiful. God will deliver uh, your, hand, your enemies into your hands. He will ensure that you have plenty, that you are all fertile and you have plenty of children. He will bless you abundantly. He will even set you above all the nations of the world. So he reads all the words of the law. 
But what else does he do in the text here? Really wants you to say, see, he reads all the words before all the people. He, Joshua here really wants you to see who all is there. Verse 35, all the assembly of Israel. And then he gives you a list. Even these, the women, the children, and the sojourners. Everyone was there to hear the word of God preached. To hear the word of God expounded and explained in red. They were there receiving instruction and submitting to God's inspired word. I, I like football. Football uh, it, it is one of the, the classic sports in, in that it's, it kind of still has its, its um, brutalness, the, the sort of Greco-Roman, not only do you have to be physically apt and, and, and able to, to perform athletically, but you have to be pretty smart, right? They, they have playbooks, pretty thick guys, and you've got to study these guys, and you've got to know how each of the parts work. But imagine a football team that's given a playbook, and nobody on the team reads it or studies it. So they go out for their first game. They go out there, and the coach is like, all right, classic. We're just going to run the power eye. It doesn't matter if you don't know what the power eye is. The analogy will still work, okay? We're not going to de delve into uh, the technical parts of football. But the, the coach calls the play, and all the players are like, got it. So they go out, and they're in the huddle, and they're all like, all right, so what's the play? He's like, all right, we're running the power eye. And the guy's like, awesome, what's that? And the other guy's like, honestly, I have no clue. I, I have no clue. I did not study the playbook whatsoever. I know uh, we're supposed to find some sort of pigskins somewhere on a gridiron. That's what they keep saying to me. I don't know. Um, and the other team, I think, is going to try to stop us. I don't know. Let's just do that. Of course, that's ridiculous. They're not going to win many games, are they? Because they don't study the playbook. They don't even know what it says. Now then, I'm not suggesting that the Bible is simply a divine playbook. It's a whole lot more than that. But honestly, how much does the average Christian really study the Scriptures? How often do most scriptures or Christians take up the scriptures in order to understand a passage in its original context? I'm terrified to think that most Christians, the duration of their study time is either on Sunday mornings while they're sitting in the pews or... Uh, their quote-unquote quiet time in the morning where they sit down and read two verses that are pulled out of context by an author who then gives you their interpretation, more or less saying, this is what this scripture means to me. I don't care what the scripture means to you. What does it mean when God spoke it? The church must function by being submissive to the corporate study of God's word. That is how we keep going. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed, is spoken forth by God himself, and is profitable for teaching, for reproving, for rebuking, for building up and instructing in righteousness that the person of God might be fully equipped to do every good work. The history of the church is even marked by this. For thousands of years, the, the majority of, of Christianity, the majority of Christians couldn't read at all. And yet, what did they do? Each opportunity they got, they went to church just so they could hear the scriptures read. Just so they could hear the scriptures read. They couldn't read it for their own. 
They went just so they could hear it and try to memorize as much as they could so they could walk around and think about it. That's why the Reformation was such an incredible thing because the whole point of the Reformation was to get people the scriptures in a language they could understand, get Bibles in the hands of the common person so they could read it for themselves. And yet, look at us. There's never been a more abundance of God's word. And dare I say it, there's never been more of an abundance of biblically illiterate Christians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 describes the sword of the Spirit. We've gone through Ephesians chapter 6, uh, the armor of God. In, in uh, verse 17, it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you haven't learned yet, it's a dangerous thing to be a Christian. It's an even more dangerous thing to be a Christian who doesn't know how to use the sword of the Spirit who doesn't know the Word of God, who doesn't know the Scriptures. But on the flip side of that, for a group of Christ followers together in submission to the Word of God, constantly training, learning, building up, crafting their skill with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is a dangerous thing as well. For Satan, we must commit ourselves to train together, to build each other up. This isn't a social club. This isn't fun hour at the local gathering. Here, we don't ride the carnival cruise. We're all on the battleship, and we're taking the gospel to the world. The Christian must be in humble obedience to the deep, rich study of God's word together. That is how we are Christian and how we build one another up in the faith. That is how we obey the word of God. So Christian, worship God corporately together by God's word. Worship God. God corporately together in obedience to his word, in unity, and worship God together in the corporate study of God's scriptures. Let us pray. O oh, great God and heavenly Father, we thank you for this time again together, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your word it's not only breathed out by you, O oh God, but that it is clear. That we can understand it, O oh God. That you have given us a spirit who indwells us, who reveals to us the things of God, who shows your word to be the inspired word of God. Lord, let us each have a deep hunger to read and study your word, O oh Lord, and let us all see how it changes us. Let us see, O oh God, how the preached word and the taught word and the proclaimed word of God results in changed lives and saved souls. God, how will the world be saved unless we preach? And how will we preach if we don't know your word? Lord, but give us a hunger. A deep, rich hunger, Lord, to come to the well of your word and drink deeply that we might not thirst. Oh God, but give us a thirst. And let us never be satisfied for anything less than drinking richly. Lord, send us now into the world that the word might be preached in the world, might see your rich word, O oh God. Save souls here and in the world. Build up your church, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.